All right, we're going to get started with the final section of chapter 14, which is entitled Change in Variables in Multiple Integrals, and we're going to be utilizing Jacobians. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce the idea of a Jacobian, which is actually a term and um, a concept borrowed from linear algebra. So first, we say that a transformation from the UV plane to the XY plane is a function T of UV that takes in an x and y um, expression and is going to output a u and v expression. So again, it associates a point in the xy plane with a point in the uv plane. We're literally transforming from one coordinate system to the next. Then xy is the image of uv under t. In other words, t is mapping uv onto xy. All right, so we'll see why this transformation is going to be useful in multiple integrals here in a moment. But first, we say that t is one to one if distinct points in the uv plane have distinct images in the xy plane. We bring this up because back when we learned about inverse functions, in order for a function to be invertible, it needs to have this property of being one to one. All right, so we say in this case, we can solve for u and v in terms of x and y to find the inverse of t, which will denote as t with the exponent of a negative one, which will be read aloud t inverse. All right, so let's just include here a schematic diagram of what this transformation might look like. Remember, we're starting in the uv plane and then we're mapping onto the xy plane. So I'm gonna draw two coordinate axes. The first one being the UV coordinate plane. The second one being the XY coordinate plane. All right, and so let's suppose that we have this nice square region in the UV coordinate plane. So I'm gonna draw a couple of vertical lines, a couple of horizontal lines, pretend that they're actually straight. And we have V equals V1, v equals v naught, uh, u equals u naught, and u equals u1. And so what we see is this square rectangular region in the uv plane. And then we're going to take our transformation t, and that's going to transform it into something in the xy plane. So perhaps this. Um, this rectangular patch in the xy plane got distorted and maybe it looks like a patch on a sphere. So I'll kind of draw these lines curved and these are the images under T. So I'm gonna call this T of U naught, T of U1, T of V1 and T of V naught. And so we have this kind of weirdly shaped patch over here. Now, as you can imagine, if we were integrating over these two regions, which one would you rather integrate over? Clearly, this kind of warped patch in the xy plane is really not what we want because it's neither a rectangular region nor a polar region. Um, so it would be very difficult to integrate over. So in fact, if we could go the other way, if we could find a T inverse, and I'll indicate that over here, that takes us from this kind of nasty looking patch in the XY plane into this nice looking rectangle in the UV plane, then that is desirable to integrate over. So that's kind of where we're heading with these transformations. Before we get there, we need to utilize the Jacobian. So you may have seen the Jacobian before, but in case you haven't, we have a definition. If T is a transformation from the UV plane to the XY plane defined by the equations X as a function of U and V and Y as a function of U and V, then the Jacobian of T, which is denoted by either J of UV or partial XY over partial UV is defined by the following. You'll notice that it is the determinant. And so I'm just going to emphasize that. It is the determinant of the matrix composed of the partial derivatives of X in the first row and the partial derivatives of Y in the second row. The order of these partial derivatives matters. So make sure that you're putting the correct partials in the correct entries of this matrix and then computing the determinant. All right, 
So before we relate this to um, multiple integrals, let's practice working with Jacobians. So for this first example, we already, has a, we already have x as a function of u and v, and we also have y as a function of u and v. And so now what we'd like to do is come up with the Jacobian. I'll write both of those notations just so that you're familiar with each. We can either write j of u, v, or partial x, y over partial u, v. All right, and then let's fill in the entries of our matrix. The um, entry in the first row, first column is the partial of x with respect to u, which is one. And first row, second column is the partial of x with respect to v, which is gonna give me a four v. And then similarly across the bottom row is gonna be the partial of y with respect to u, which is a four u, and the partial of y with respect to v, which is a negative one. And so now I'm going to carry out the determinant just by multiplying across the diagonals. That gives me a negative one. And then I subtract the other diagonal. So minus 16 uv. And this expression in u and v is going to be my Jacobian. All right. Now, typically, when we're working with these problems, what we're going to have is um, we're going to take a region in the xy plane and we're going to want to look at the inverse transformation. So we're going to want to transform it at, into x as a function of u and v, but they won't necessarily begin that way. And so for our next example here, we have u as a function of x and y and v as a function of x and y. We want to find the Jacobian. So our first step is to find x as a function of u and v and y as a function of u and v. Once we have found that, then we'll be able to set up our Jacobian by taking the partials. So we just have one additional step as compared to problem two that we just finished. All right, so what I'm gonna do here is in the first u equation, I'm gonna solve for x. So I have x equals u plus three y. Now this isn't x as a function of u and v, right now it's x as a function of u and y. So we still need to do some more work. In the second equation, I'm gonna solve for y. So y is v minus three x. All right, so again, I'm not finished, but what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna to choose to plug in this expression for y into my u equation. So let's do that next. So I have x equals u plus three. And now what I had was y as a function of v and x. So plug that in. And now this new equation has three variables, x, u's, and v's. So now I can solve for x. So first I'll distribute my three. Then I'll collect all the x terms on one side. And finally, I'll divide through by that constant 10. And what I conclude is x equals 1 tenth u plus 3 tenths v. All right, so this now is x as a function of u and v. I'd like to get a similar function for y. And so now that I know what x is, um, I could just plug this in uh, up top. Or what I can do is I can now use, again, let me get a different color, take this expression for x and plug it in over here to my y equation. So using this, what I have is y equals v minus three times u plus three y. And so going through the same motions here, I have v minus three u minus nine y. So 10 y equals v minus three u. And then finally, I get y as a function of u and v. I'm gonna change the order. I like to put my u's first and my v's second, just so that when I'm taking partial derivatives, I don't make any silly mistakes. So this is a negative three tenths u plus one tenth v. All right, so now I have this written out and now what I would like to do is compute my Jacobian. All right, in the first row, first column, I want the partial of x with respect to u, which is a one tenth. 
First row, second column is the partial with respect to V, which is a three tenths. And now I'm gonna move on to the second row, which is all the partials of Y. So with respect to U is negative three tenths, with respect to V is one tenth. And so now I'll carry out this determinant. Multiplying across the main diagonal gives me a one one hundredth. And then subtract off the other product becomes a plus nine one hundredths becomes 10 one hundredths or one tenth. So this is my Jacobian value. All right, so we've had some practice working with Jacobians. Um, now we'd like to relate them to multiple integrals. All right, so we have our change of variables formula here at the bottom of page two, and it says the following. If the transformation X and Y maps the region S in the UV plane onto the region R in the XY plane, and if the Jacobian is non-zero and does not change sign on your region, then with appropriate restrictions on the transformation in the regions, it follows that you can take your double integral in terms of X and Y, and you can rewrite it as a double integral in terms of U and V, but you need to remember that in doing so, you have to pay for that transformation with the Jacobian factor, all right, where then everything else is in terms of U and V. Notice that they added these subscripts on here. DA in the first double integral is in terms of X and Y. In the second double integral, it's in terms of U and V. And again, R is the region in X, Y, and S is the region in UV. The idea behind this is that we're gonna have a non-desirable region in the X, Y plane, but if only we could transform it, whether that means rotate it, shift it, or however that may be, that if we could we can make it into some easier looking um, region in the UV plane that that's going to simplify our um, double integration. I want to also call your attention to just a couple hypotheses here in this change of variables formula. In particular, the Jacobian needs to be non-zero and it needs to not change signs on your region S. So that's something that I'm gonna look at whenever I'm working out these problems, making sure that I'm meeting these hypotheses so that I can move forward with this change of variables formula. All right, so we have two examples of how to actually utilize this formula. Let's look at our first example. Use Jacobians to solve the problem. All right, number 22. Use the transformation u equals x plus y and v equals x minus y to find the double integral over r of that stated integrand over the rectangular region enclosed by the lines x plus y equals 0, x plus y equals 1, x minus y equals 1, and x minus y equals 4. All right, before we get started, what I'd like to do is I'd like to sketch this region r. What does this region actually look like? And so um, I'm going to solve all of these equations for y. I have y equals negative x, y equals negative x plus 1, y equals x plus 1, and y equals x plus 4. So let's plot this region and see what it looks like in the um, xy plane. All right, so y equals negative x. And it looks like maybe, mm, let me actually make these a little bit larger. I need both the positive and negative x axis. All right. So y equals negative x. Here's the negative identity function. And then we also want negative x plus 1. All right, so now we want y equals x plus 1. And finally, y equals x plus 4. All right, so we can see the region bounded here. I'll highlight it in yellow. All right, this is our region R. It's a nice rectangular region, but it's not nice in the fact that 
this rectangular region has been tilted. So if only we could like tilt our heads a certain degree, either to the left or to the right, we could see it as an upright um, rectangle, but right now it is um, tilted. And so what we would like to do is we would like to change our view into some UV plane so that this becomes a standard rectangular region in the UV plane. All right, in order to do that, what we need to do is we need to transform our variables. And so um, we already have u and v defined for us. So u is x plus y and v is x minus y. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with each of these to solve for one variable. Um, in the u equation, I will solve for y. In the V equation, I will solve for X. And then as we did in the previous example, I'm just gonna start plugging these expressions into one another. So I'll start by taking the Y equation and plugging into the Y variable here. So I have X equals V plus U minus X. So I have two X equals U plus V. So X is one half U plus one half V. Similarly, I'm gonna take the Y equation and I have Y equals U minus plugging in the X expression, V plus Y. So this gives me two Y equals U minus V or Y equals one half U minus one half V. All right, so now that we have these expressions, we can compute our Jacobian. The first row being the partials of X with respect to U and V, so one half and one half. The second row being the partials of Y with respect to U and V, one half and negative one half. So when I carry out this Jacobian, I get a negative one fourth minus one fourth, which gives me a negative one half. All right, so at this moment, I'm gonna check those hypotheses. The first one is that our Jacobian is non-zero on our region, true. And the other one is that it's not gonna change sign. So I'm just gonna make a note here. Since our Jacobian is constant, it cannot change signs. All right, it just happens to be the case that this Jacobian is constant. It's completely possible that our Jacobian will be an expression in terms of U and V. And so if that's the case, then you'll need to look at your range of values in U and V and see if it's possible if your Jacobian can change sign. But it, of course, here in this case, we, can, we see that it's not gonna change sign since it's just a constant. All right, so now that we have that Jacobian factor computed, we can now begin to set up our integrals. The first thing I want to note here, let me scroll back up. Remember that, oops, let me get a, u is x plus y. And so I see x plus y here and here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a note that these are the equations u equals 0 and u equals 1. And then similarly, what we have here is v is x minus y and I see X minus Y here and here. So I'm gonna write those out as V equals one and V equals four. So we can see why doing this transformation was very beneficial here because now our new um, bounding lines in the UV plane are truly gonna bound a rectangle. So I'll just draw a quick sketch of that up here. I only need the first quadrant. So our horizontal axis is U, our vertical axis is V, and we have U equals zero, which is just the V axis, U equals one, V equals one, and this is not to scale, but V equals four. So here is our new region, which we're calling S. All right, this is a much more agreeable re region to integrate over. 
And furthermore, now that we have sketched it, we see what our limits of integration are gonna be in terms of u and v. All right, so let's come back down here and let's set up our new integral. So our new integral, let's zoom out so that we can see the original statement. Um, I'll come back to our limits of integration. This is gonna become v e to the what? So if I come back up here, this exponent here, x squared minus y squared can be factored to an x plus y times an x minus y. So what we see is that's the product of u and v. So I'll plug that in down below. Then I need the absolute value of my Jacobian factor. And then I need a dA where this is assumed to be in terms of u and v. All right. So again, if we look back up at that blue illustration up top, we see what our integration is going to be in terms of. V is ranging from 1 to 4. U is ranging from 0 to 1. And then we just need to determine what order of integration we want to use. Fubini's theorem tells us that since we're integrating over a rectangular region, the order doesn't matter. If I look at my integrand here, which order is going to be easier? Certainly u is going to be easier. If I do integrate with respect to v first, I'm going to need an integration by parts. So let's integrate with respect to u and hope that once we do that integration, um, it simplifies our second iteration of integration. So I'm going to rewrite my integrand. I want to integrate with respect to u first and then v. And then I'll plug in my limits of integration. Remember, u is ranging from 0 to 1. v is ranging from 1 to 4. All right. And so here is our setup. And so now let's go ahead and integrate. The v is just a constant. I do need to integrate with respect to u. So what I'm going to do is a substitution. Now, normally for my substitutions, I use u substitution, but since I'm already using the u variable, I'm gonna call it a w substitution. Let's let w equal uv, and then dw, remember I wanna integrate with respect to u, is gonna give me a v du. So I see that v du here directly. And so I'm going to leave off my limits of integration for now. And this becomes a one half e to the w dw dv. So let's go ahead and integrate with respect to w. That becomes just e to the w, but I'm already going to resubstitute. I'm going to re put in uv. And then remember, I wanted to evaluate u from 0 to 1. So rewriting my outer integral here. I get a one half of e to the v and then minus e to the zero, which is of course one. All right, and so let's carry out our last iteration of the integration. This is gonna become a one half e to the v minus v, where v is ranging from one to four. And so this is one half times e to the 4 minus 4 minus e to the 1 minus 1. And so if I'm combining constants, I have a negative 4 plus 1 is a negative 3. I'm going to write my final answer as 1 half e to the 4th minus e minus 3. And this is my final answer. So again, when you're looking at this kind of from afar, and I'll zoom out so that we can see it all in one, you can see that where we started out with, that bounding rectangle that I colored in yellow in the xy plane, it would have just been such a nightmare to integrate in rectangular coordinates. Doesn't matter whether you would have taken vertical slices or horizontal slices. That is whether you would have done it in dx dy or dy dx. In either case, you would have had to broken that region up into um, one, two, three separate integrals in order to handle that. And so by doing this transformation, it made the integration a lot more straightforward, um, much easier to compute. All right, so we have one more example here of working with these double integrals and utilizing the transformation process with Jacobians. 
But first, I have a little bit of a procedure here to help you solve for um, the limits of integration and, and, and how you're going to change your variables. So step one is to find the Jacobian by solving for X and Y in terms of U and V and computing the determinant. Um, in the last example, U and V were defined for us. If it's not given in the problem, use your best judgment. Ask yourself, what would make sense for a U and V substitution here? What would simplify both my integrand, but also my region of integration? Step two, find the U and V limits of integration by transforming the equations of the boundary curves into equations in U and V. Sketching the region may be helpful. All right. When I think back to the last example, it was really easy to transform those because we could blatantly see U and V in those equations. If it's not so obvious, just use your U and V equations and substitute in for X and Y. And we'll see examples of that. And then finally, once you have um, written your integral in terms of U and V, then carry out the uh, integration here. All right, so let's look at our next example. It says make an appropriate change of variables to evaluate the integral. So we have the double integral over R of E to the Y minus X over Y plus X dA. And just by looking at that integral, before I even consider my region of integration, if I had to make a guess of what I'm gonna let U and V be, I'm probably gonna guess uh, Y minus X and Y plus X, just because I see those expressions there in this integrand. But before we make that judgment call, let's go ahead and take a look at what our region is. So R is the region in the first quadrant enclosed by the trapezoid with those stated vertices. So let's go ahead and sketch this trapezoid. All right, so we have zero, one and one, zero. And then we also have zero, four and four, zero. And I'll just kind of color this region in here. This is our region R in the XY plane. Now let's take a look at this for a moment. If we wanted to integrate over this trapezoid, and let's just pretend for a moment that we were taking vertical slices, then what we would need to do is we would need to split this region up here at this vertex, which is where the lower bounding line changes from that slant line to the X axis. So we could integrate over this, but what we would have to do is split it up into two double integrals, which isn't the end of the world. However, when we look back up at our integrand, I'm really not even sure that I know how to integrate that in terms of X and Y. So it's kind of a double whammy in this example where not only is the region not desirable because we would have to split it up, but also the integrand is not desirable. So perhaps um, a change in variables is gonna be useful. Now, we still aren't completely convinced on whether we know what is the best choice for U and V. So what I'd like to do is I would like to um, write out the boundary equations um, for all of the lines bounding the trapezoid. Now we have the x-axis, which is y equals zero, and we have the y-axis, which is x equals zero, and then we have the slant lines. So this slant line here has a y-intercept of one and a slope of negative one, so this is y equals negative x plus one, and then this is similar, but just a different y-intercept, y equals negative x plus four. Now, if you rewrote those two slant lines, and I'll do it in blue here, we could look at these as x plus y equals four, and similarly, x plus y equals one. So in looking back up at this integrand, since we see an x plus y there and also an x plus y in our bounding lines, that is a good indicator that perhaps x plus y should be one of our terms. And then um, the other two lines, x equals zero and y equals zero, they don't really give us any indication of any other type of a substitution for a change of variables. So looking back up at our integrand, I'm gonna stick by what I said initially that I'm gonna let y minus x be one of the uh, variables and y plus x be the other variable. Now it doesn't matter which one you choose to be which expression. I'm gonna arbitrarily choose u to be y minus x 
and I'm going to choose V to be Y plus X. But if you swapped your U and V, that's perfectly fine. All right, now what I'd like to do is I'd like to solve for X and Y so that I can determine my Jacobian. So I'm going to write this as Y equals U plus X. But if you wanted to solve for X, that's perfectly fine. And I'm going to solve for X over here in the V equation, X equals V minus Y. So now just start plugging in one into, into the other. So Y equals U plus V minus Y. 2Y equals U plus V. Y equals 1 half U plus 1 half V. All right, and then same, um, same thing here in the other equation. X equals V minus U plus X. So 2X equals V minus U. I'm going to reverse the order of U and V so that I make sure that I take the partials correctly in my Jacobian. X equals negative 1 half U plus 1 half V. So this looks very similar to um, what the Jacobian was in the previous example. So now let's find the Jacobian of this transformation. First row is the partials of X. So that's going to give me a negative 1 half and a 1 half. Second row is the partials of Y, which are both positive. And so my Jacobian here is a negative 1 fourth minus 1 fourth. So we're getting a Jacobian here of negative 1 half again. So I'm just going to make this note here. This Jacobian is non-zero everywhere on our region, and it doesn't change sign. So just a good habit to get into here um, to check to make sure that you're meeting those hypotheses. All right, so now what we need to do is we need to figure out what our new limits of integration are going to be. So what I'd like to do is I would like to transform each of my four equations that are bounding the trapezoid. So let's write those out, right? We have X equals zero. We have Y equals zero. We have Y equals negative X plus one. And we have Y equals negative X plus four. We had already mentioned that these bottom two are easy to transform. If we move the x over, then we see an x plus y expression, which is just v. And same here, x plus y equals 4. So v equals 4. So those ones were pretty easy to transform. For these other ones, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, well, I see an x here. And so looking at my other green highlighted formula, I'm just going to plug in what x equals. So I have negative 1 half u plus 1 half v equals 0. So if I solve here, what I get is v equals u. So this is an equation in u and v that's been simplified. Let's do the exact same thing for y. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to recognize that I have a y on the left but I also know what y is in terms of u and v. So I get a 1 half u plus 1 half v equals 0. In other words, v is negative u. Let's sketch this region so that we can see what it looks like in the uv plane. So let's label our axes. These are now u and v, not x and y. We have v equals 1 and v equals 4. And then we have the identity function v equals, uh, excuse me, v equals u. And we have the negative identity function. v equals negative u. So now let's shade in our new trapezoid. And we ask ourselves, are we in better shape than we were previously? 
So we still don't really want to do vertical slices because we'd have to split it up into three regions. But as long as we do horizontal slices here, our rightmost bounding function is always v equals u. The leftmost bounding function is v equals negative u. And then we have these nice flat lines here ranging from v equals 1 to v equals 4. So we can now see a path forward on how we're going to set up this integral in terms of u and v. So let's go ahead and set it up. First, I'll do it in generality, the double integral over s of, what was our integrand here? e to the u over v. And then we need the absolute value of our Jacobian factor. And then finally, we have a dA in terms of u and v. So we had just decided by looking at this new graph in terms of u and v that horizontal slices were going to be our best bet. Notice that the thickness of that slice is in the dy direction. So that tells me the order of my differentials is dx dy. Excuse me, not dx dy. It's going to be dv du. So I have a 1 half e to the u over v dv, yeah, and let me correct this here. This is a dv. So used to writing things in terms of, um, darn it, we'll get it right here finally. I want v on the end. So this is going to be dv, du, dv. Ha, ah, there we go, du, dv. All right, so what is our u ranging from? Well, the rightmost curve is u equals v. The leftmost curve is u equals negative v. And then V is ranging from 1 to 4. All right, we have officially set up our integral in terms of U and V. What I'd like to do now is I would like to integrate first with respect to U. All right, again, let's do a W substitution over here. W equals U over V. That tells me that DW, I'm taking the derivative with respect to U, is a 1 over v uh, du. All right. And so what I get here is v dw is du. So where I see my du, I'm going to plug in a v dw. So this is the integral from 1 to 4. I'll leave off my limits of integration here. I have a 1 half v e to the w dw dv. So when I integrate with respect to w, I just get e to the w back out. So again, I'm just going to resubstitute here. This is a 1 half v e to the, instead of w, I'll write u over v, where u is being evaluated from negative v to v dv. So let's plug these things in here. I have the integral from 1 to 4 a 1 half v, and then this becomes an e to the 1 minus an e to the negative 1. Notice that this expression in the parentheses and the 1 half, those are all just constants. So when I integrate with respect to v, I'm really only integrating that single linear v term, which is going to become a 1 half v squared. So I get a 1 fourth e minus 1 over e v squared, where v is running from 1 to 4. So if I plug that in, 4 squared is 16, minus 1 squared is 15. And so my final answer here is a 15 over 4 e minus 1 over e. All right, so hopefully you can see the value in utilizing this transformation of variables in order to simplify both complex looking integrands, but also complex or undesirable looking regions in the XY plane. Thanks for tuning in.